So this is our third business session, and again, the sponsor is ICBC, so we going to do a wave this time. So our next, um, next presentation, um, it's kind of interesting, it's a tag team, and it features the Bose, what do you call it, the anti-vibration? Bose ride system. The Bose ride system. And we've got two presenters, but they're not necessarily both from Bose. I didn't realize that until I talked to them a little earlier. From uh, Bose, we've actually got uh, Ralph uh, Tracomi. I got that right. And Ralph is a member of the Bose Ride System Market Development Team. Currently, uh, he is responsible for fleets and heavy truck dealerships throughout Canada, North Central United States. His activities include leading pioneering field deployments. Prior to joining the Bose Corporation, Ralph held several marketing sales production planning and franchising positions with the Ford Motor Company. Holds a Master of Business Administration from Boston University and a Bachelor of Arts degree from Boston College. And when you hear him talk, he's from Boston. <laughs> Second member of the tag team is um, Peter Johnson, who is not from Bose. He is from the, he is an associate professor at the University of Washington in the Occupational and Environmental Exposure Sciences Program. Specializing in, ergonomics, specializing in ergonomics. Earned his doctorate in bioengineering from the University of California at Berkeley and has worked as a researcher at the National Institutes of Occupational Health in the United States, Sweden, and Denmark. That's NIOSH for those of you who are impressed with, uh, with those things. Uh, the goal of his research is to collect information on whole body vibration, exposures from vehicle drivers, and identifying engineering and administrative controls for reducing the effects of whole body vibration on truck drivers. And uh, Peter kind of got into the Bose uh, project by hearing about it. Uh, it was his area of research. Uh, he heard about the research or the work that's been going on at Bose, and he came in. and This is sort of a, a joint research market development venture. Mm -hmm. Interesting stuff. So we're starting with the the guy in the green shirt. Okay. Round of applause. And. Uh There we go. Okay, thank you, Scott. So uh, the Trucking Safety Council required me to do full disclosure, so I have to disclose I'm not Canadian. Um, but uh, I'm near Canadian. I grew up in Minnesota, close to Canada. I claim Labatt's Crystal as my regional brew. Uh, I lived in California for a while, got uncomfortable with that, so I moved back near Canada to Washington. So. I'm a near Canadian and I almost have a uh, Canadian accent with my Minnesota accent. So I'm going to talk about whole body vibration and this is a tough lecture because you've had lunch, you're digesting and now what Pat talked about, you're having your post-lunch fatigue depression and I have to try and keep you uh, awake. So I'm going to uh, may have it be a little bit interactive. Does anybody know what a pic this is a picture of? And the answer is not a semi-tractor and trailer. Anybody know what road that is? That's the Elkan Highway. Has anybody driven the Elkan? Raise your hands. Oh, not too many. Okay. If you've uh, driven the Elkan when it was a dirt road, raise your hand. Okay. So, Pat, around 32 years ago, I went by your house and probably sent a dust plume uh, near your way. So, 32 years ago, when I was 16, my best friend John Simons and I drove to Alaska. And here's a picture, and with the lighting you can't see it, but on, on the bottom of the sign it says, leave while you still can. <laughs> and back in the day, they didn't have a lot of convenience stores on the Elkhorn, so you often had to fend for yourself for food. And I mean literally fend for yourself. You can't see this, but there's an elk here, and this is my buddy John trying to get it with his knife so we could eat that <laughs> night. And unfortunately, the elk was faster than John was, and we went hungry that night. So I come from Washington State. British Columbia is right here. And uh, we're fortunate. We have a great program at our labors and industries called Safety and Health and Research for Prevention. And they've done a lot of work on trucking. And they have this brochure, brochure here on their website, keeptruckingsafe.com, about injuries in the trucking sector in Washington State. 
And Washington State is as near Canadian as you can get because our state is one of the few states in the United States which runs the workers' compensation system. The larger companies can self-insure and don't have to be under our workers' compensation system. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'll go back. There's two epidemics uh, that are coming up. And both of these epidemics are represented in these rooms, two public health epidemics. Does anybody know what they are? Aging is one. We have all this bolus of baby boomers going through the workforce. So we're going to have record numbers of older workers, greater numbers. Anybody know the other epidemic? Obesity. I heard uh, Delia call this something. I think in the UK this is a dark muscle. So uh, two epidemics. So this is just showing the average age of truck drivers in Washington. Uh, between 1997 and 2005, the average age uh, increased in the workforce from 39 to 42. Other companies, it's a lot higher. What this is showing is the employment by uh, age group and uh, the number of claims. So you can see uh, as we get older, there's a greater percentage of claims and the cost of the claims. But uh, the good news is, as some of us get older, we get wiser and there's a lower number of claims. That's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is who's your most valuable workers? It's probably your older workers. They have the most experience, uh, work uh, with the greatest productivity, have the greatest knowledge. So when you look at claim cost as a function of age, your claims with your older workers are your higher cost claims. And with the growing number of baby boomers going through the workforce, people working longer, if there's ever a group you probably want to protect to reduce your costs is it's the older workers. All workers too, as a matter of fact. So this is showing injury rates in Washington State uh, in, in all industries, uh, roughly around 2.2% of the, or 2.2.5% of the workforce gets injured. And if you look compared to the trucking center, uh, the trucking sector, there's a three to four fold increase in injury rates relative to all industries in Washington State. The good news for me, I'm a musculoskeletal re researcher. This stands for musculoskeletal disorders, the single largest component of workers' compensation claims in Washington State are musculoskeletal disorders. Um, what's the most costliest claim for your, uh, you folks in the trucking industry? What's that? Well, that's close. That's number two. What's your most costliest claim? And they don't happen that often, thank goodness. Accidents. So uh, accidents are the most costly claim, and this shows cost of average claim uh, by type of uh, occurrence. And here you see the average cost of a musculoskeletal claim where there's a low back claim with days away from work is 30,000 US dollars. Fortunately, that's very similar to 30,000 Canadian dollars these days. But if you look at the occurrence, these occur 40% of the time. The total cost in Washington state is over a quarter million dollars. So by looking at the cost and the frequency, these low back claims are a very big cost burden. So what is whole body vibration? Um, and I thought the uh, program was interesting because it uh, called it full body vibration. I was thinking the full Monty inside, and I don't want to have to go there. So it's an objective uh, description of operator motion. And it's a, a vector quantity. It has both magnitude and direction of motion. And there's two things we usually characterize. One is the frequency of the vibration, and the other uh, is the magnitude. And we put a little rubber disc on the driver's seat, and it measures the up and down exposure. That's in Canadian, the Z axis. Uh, side to side is Y, and fore and aft is the X axis. So we measure their triaxial exposure. And with humans, we're really interested in vibration frequencies between 1 and 10 hertz. That's things that oscillate 1 time a second up to 10 times a second. And I can't even wave my hand that fast. Um, so this is a picture of uh, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Does anybody ever remember seeing the film clip of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge? Yeah, it's called Galloping Gertie. The energy content of the wind matched the energy content of the bridge. And 
When that happens, structures do things that they otherwise normally wouldn't do. Well, I, I think I'll just... So that's what happens with whole body vibration. Certain body parts have natural resonant frequencies and the vibration energy from the vehicle matches that in your spine and it kind of makes your back move in ways that otherwise normally wouldn't move. So if we look at your spinal column, that has a resonant or excitation frequency of 10 to 12 oscillations a second. If you have a dart muscle like me, four to six uh, uh, hertz is the resonant frequency and your shoulder is four to five hertz. So those are the frequencies that really get your body excited and moving in ways it normally does not move. So to collect vibration data, we have a system where we put an accelerometer, and ours is a seat pad accelerometer that the driver sits on, but we also put one on the floor so we can compare how's the seat doing relative to what we measure at the floor of the vehicle. We have to have a data logger to collect it, and then we kind of have to process the data and make it into a meaningful metric. And usually it's uh, your acceleration that your body's undergoing in meters per second squared. And we started out doing a lot of work uh, with buses in Seattle. And this is just some typical vibration data. The yellow is the floor, and the purple is what we measured at the seat. And this is just showing stop and go traffic, where it's, they're being exposed when the vehicle's moving, but when they stop at the stoplight, the vibration goes away. These yellow lines here, if you can see them, thump, 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 thump. Thump, thump. That's a bus going over uh, expansion joints on a freeway, so you see these high impulses, but the seat gets rid of it. And then here's somebody going over speed humps at a slow speed and then really putting the, the pedal down and going over them at a fast speed. So that's what the data looks like that we collect. As far as sources and controls for vibration, you have the semi-truck tires, but with 115 PSI, good luck with them doing anything to reduce the vibration. You have cab suspension, uh, um, vehicle suspension, and your seat suspension. If you want to replace things, maybe the least cost, of, uh, least cost thing to replace is the seat. So a seat seems like a logical place for trying to do some exposure control. As far as whole body vibration and back pain, um, uh, back injuries are the significant, uh, most significant non-lethal uh, work uh, disorder affecting the U.S. workforce, same in Canada and the whole world. Uh, there's been a strong association between exposure to whole body vibration and low back pain, and uh, there's been shown to be somewhat of a dose-response relationship. The longer you're exposed, the greater the risk and the more likelihood that you're going to develop low back pain. So what this uh, picture shows is the pressure on the intervertebral disc. In between our vertebral body, we have this shock absorber made out of cartilage. And when we're laying down, it's the lowest. So uh, once we're done sleeping for Pat, when we stand up, uh, the disc pressure increases by 75%. Then if you happen to have the misfortune of having to sit down, it increases another 50%. And then if you sit with bad posture to make delia mad, then it goes up another 50% to 200%. It doubles. So there's a lot going against us sitting in a truck. We have this vibration and this bad posture. And uh, all of this can contribute, or we believe can contribute, to the low back pain we see in a lot of these vehicle operators. And what happens when we sit in a slouched position, you have the front of your intervertebral disc in compression and the back of your intervertebral disc in tension. So if that wasn't bad enough news, there's a lot of other effects from whole body vibration. There's cardiovascular effects, uh, metabolic effects, respiratory effects, and even motor control problems. So a lot of other downstream uh, effects as well. So the first thing I'd like to show you is seat, how seat design can matter. Um, and this study was done, and I don't want to give the company's name away, a large jet aircraft manufacturer in uh, Seattle. We did this study, but I'm not going to say the name. Um, and we were interested in measuring whole body vibration exposure in forklift operators. So we got 12 of their operators, mean age of 44.3 years, mean experience of 17 years, uh, if you're light, and I could almost work at this corporation as a light worker, you're 185 pounds. 
Uh, if you're heavy, heavy is defined as greater than 256 pounds or 116 kilograms. Uh, they all drove the same forklift and we had them do two tasks. Once they, one, we measured their whole body vibration when they did their actual work. And then the other thing to get an apples and apples comparison between these seats, we had them do, go on a standardized route. And we compared two seats. We compared a uh, mechanical suspension uh, forklift seat made by Grammar, and then we compared it to their uh, air suspension counterpart. And so the difference is between around $550 versus $750. So we collected the data and we were interested in comparing whether there is a difference in whole body vibration exposure and attenuation between the seats. Um, this is our standardized route that they went on. They went outside this big building. And then uh, we also collected GPS simultaneously so we could get their speed and location. Then they went inside the building and came back to the starting spot. This just shows our GPS data along the route. And you can see in the fifth segment, we lost it because the vehicle is inside the building. And you can kind of see how our vibration data corresponds in that segment inside the building. You can see how smooth the exposure is relative to the terrain outside of the building. So what this slide shows is the uh, vibration exposure when they're doing their actual work and going on the standardized route. And the light blue is what we measured from the floor of the forklift and the, the maroon is what we measured from the seat. And this is the uh, ISO uh, action limit. Uh, whereas if your uh, eight hour vibration exposure is above 0.5 meters per second squared, you have a moderate risk for some sort of uh, adverse health come uh, happening eventually. If it's above 1.15 meters per second squared, there's almost a certainty you're gonna have problems. So you can see that the exposure during the standardized route was greater than the actual work, but you can see how the seat did a nice job attenuating the exposure, and this was an average over both of the seats. And the reason why, does anybody know why the exposure was lower during their actual work? When you're driving a forklift, you're not always moving around, right? You're waiting for your next call or you're unloading things. So that's why we had this difference. But to get our apples and apples comparison between seats, we wanted to use the standardized route. Um, and I don't know how to explain this. Are you more familiar with American football or college football? Or Canadian? <laughs> well, I grew up in Minneapolis, so let me do it this way. So in... Uh, Green Bay Packer green is the performance of the mechanical seat and Minnesota Vikings purple is the performance of the air ride seat. So what we saw is there's a significant difference in whole body vibration exposure with it being lower in the, when the drivers operated the forklift with the air ride seat. Now this is showing the results by weight class and you can see with the mechanical seat it behaved like the spring. Uh, ironically, the heavier you were, the lower the exposure. Uh, the spring was probably designed for heavier people and the lighter people were getting pushed off. Where what was nice is the air ride uh, seat had less of a weight dependent exposure. And basically our recommendation to this company was to hire drivers that were the same mass as the forklift and then they would get impedance matching and not have any problems. I haven't checked back to see if they did that. So now I'd like to, we've been finding out that there are actually some challenges with uh, air suspension seats. And we've been doing this research for around six years and we're still learning things. So that's the exciting thing about it. So one of the challenges is you're driving down a road and you hit a bump. And ideally you would have this magic carpet ride where your seat doesn't follow the vehicle into the bump. But unfortunately with mechanical and air suspension seats, the seat's gonna pull you down into the bump you hit the other end of the bump, you hit it, and the seat's gonna kick you out of the bump. And in some instances on rough roads, uh, what happens is the seat actually amplifies your exposure rather than attenuating it. So with our bus research in Seattle, we created this standardized route, basically. Uh, it's around a 60 kilometer route where they started out, they started at the bus base and they drove on city streets. Then they went across a nice new freeway, uh, I-90. Then they went on a course of speed humps at the Bellevue Community College. 
And then they came back on an old tired freeway with expansion joints, I-5. And uh, we measured and characterized their vibration exposure on this route with different seats, different types of buses. And so in this first study, we tested a one-year-old bus, relatively new, with a one-year-old air ride seat. Uh, does anybody want to guess how much of the vibration that air ride seat attenuated the vibration exposure measured relative to the floor? How about some guesses? And I'll give 20 bucks US to anybody that gets the correct guess to promote some participation. Attenuated 10%? 50%. I hear 50. 80. 80. <laughs> Do I hear anything lower than 80? What's that? 18. All right. The good answers. Well, to our surprise, uh, this might be hard to see, but red indicates the seat is amplifying the exposure. Orange indicates it's attenuating it between 0 to 20%. And you don't see any yellow, which is attenuating between uh, 20 to 40 percent. On average, over this whole route, the air ride seat ended up not attenuating uh, the exposure at all, on average. So we were kind of surprised by that. So we did another study, and this time it was around a six-year-old bus, but we put in a brand new air ride seat. Now does anybody want to guess what the uh, attenuation was? Zero. You should have guessed that the first time. <laughs> okay. Uh, so when we did it with a new air ride seat, uh, it did a good job. Uh, a fair proportion of the time it was attenuating it between zero and 20 percent. Uh, was amplifying it less, but on average it was attenuating 12 percent of the vibration exposure. So we were kind of surprised by that. We thought an air ride seat would do more. And if you looked at that Fork truck example, it certainly did. So what we're learning is at slower speeds, it looks like air ride seats do a lot better job, but at higher speeds, they just don't have the frequency response they need to attenuate the perturbations in the terrain. Okay. So now I'd like to talk about new technology seats. Scott mentioned our work with Bose, and what happened is I had a grant from our department to study whole body vibration exposure in buses, and then I got a federal grant to study the same thing. So there is a duplication of effort. So I proposed to my chair, I said, hey, why don't I use the department money, money to uh, study whole body vibration exposure in anything but buses? So we're kind of looking for some opportunities to spend this money. And I, a graduate student found about the seat made by Bose. And we called Bose. And I said, hey, how would you like us to uh, evaluate your seat? So we're trying to look, uh, we have this grant to look at uh, vibration engineering controls, would you be interested in that? And fortunately, they said yes. Um, so we've covered mechanical seats, we've covered air ride seats, and so now I want to talk uh, about this performance of this electric uh, seat with this electromechanically active suspension. We've seen that a mechanical seats, uh, cost-wise, it's moderate, does okay, attenuating whole body vibration to exposure, but as weight-dependent performance, air ride seat costs a little bit more, but does a little bit better job, but we still have some problems with them amplifying. And what I'm going to show you is how this uh, uh, electromechanical suspension seat performed. It's not cheap, uh, so I want to show well, what we found out about its ability to attenuate whole body vibration. Um, so these new active suspension seats have come out, and uh, they've been designed for the truck market. Um, and what this slide shows is there is a gentleman here um, in an air ride seat on the left and another gentleman here in the electromechanically active suspension seat on the right. And uh, this guy looks worried and this guy looks like he's in control. So I think this is the subordinate and that's the superior, but I'm not sure. And this is just showing going over a washboard road. If you rode, uh, looked at the Bose demonstration, you can see how this guy is shaking around and this guy is pretty still. Then they're going to uh, lift up their feet and you can see the difference in the feet. Uh, so just showing the fast frequency response, and well, it's hard to see, uh, and the difference between the air ride and the active suspension seat. And I can't vouch that this guy didn't have a cup of coffee before this was filmed. <laughs> and just showing the differences in the arm. 
Uh, so how does this seat work? Uh, basically, it has an air suspension system like a traditional air ride seat. Uh, in parallel, uh, it has uh, an accelerometer in the seat base and a microprocessor to um, measure and process the acceleration. And then it has a linear electromagnetic actuator in the middle to try and counteract the acceleration. So how fast does oil and air respond? If you throw a, you know, a rock into a pond, that wave doesn't go out very fast. So there's slow frequency response for uh, hydraulics and pneumatics, whereas this linear electromagnetic actuator responds at the speed of electricity, or light basically, very fast. So it has a very high frequency response. So I finally refer to it that as the UW, we went on covert whole body vibration operations to Framingham, Massachusetts, where Bose was based. For those of you familiar with semis, we had two freight shakers with loaded skateboards, which we drove around the route. There were two uh, uh, cab semis, sleeper cab semis, and the flatbeds were loaded with jersey barriers. In one of these cabs, we put in a new air ride seat and in the other uh, cab, we put in the new technology active suspension seat. We had 16 truck drivers come in, and they went on the 60-kilometer route uh, through uh, the Boston area. They came back, they swapped trucks again, and drove on the same route again. Midway through the study, we swapped the vehicles between trucks to make sure there wasn't a truck suspension effect. And then we compared the whole body vibration exposures between the air ride seat and the new technology active suspension seat. So this is the route. There was uh, two kilometers of rough road where a company had patched and repaired its service road around 400 times. Uh, there was uh, highway driving, probably driving around 35 kilometers per hour. We measured from stop and go traffic, probably average speed 10 to 15 kilometers per hour. And we had, hard to see, a freeway portion where they got up to around 65 kilometers per hour. Didn't get up to full freeway speed. And so we measured the vibration exposures over that whole route and also measured from the floor of the vehicle. So here shows the results. The new technology active suspension seat is in blue and the uh, passive suspension air ride seat is in red. So as far as fore aft exposures, there were no differences in the seats. Side to side, there were no differences in the seat, but the seat was really designed to reduce the up and down exposure. And with the air ride seat is 0.4 meters per second squared. Uh, with the uh, new technology active suspension seat, it was reduced, cut in half to 0.18 meters per second squared. So this is probably actually smoother than my SUV. So it took a, a semi-tractor exposure and reduced it down to basically what you get driving your car. Here's what we measured from the floor. So again, I can show you the attenuation, and I'll call it attenuation. So here, the air suspension seat reduced the vibration exposure by around 5%, similar to what we saw on the buses. So this isn't an isolated event, whereas the active suspension seat reduced the whole body vibration exposures by around 64%. Um, so this is our route again for the air ride seat, showing where it's attenuating and amplifying the exposure. You really can't see it too well. Red is where the seat's amplifying. Orange is where it's attenuating it between 0 and 20%. And yellow is where it's attenuating the vibration exposure between 20 and 40%. So here on average, over this whole route, that air ride seat was attenuating the whole body vibration exposures by 5%. When we studied this EM active seat, we had to make a new scale and new colors, and here's the results for the EM active seat. Uh, almost all the time, it's attenuating between 60 to 80% of the vibration, so on average attenuating 64% of the vibration. So pretty amazing how this engineering control technology works. So what are we doing in Washington? So I'm almost, I'm an engineer and I'm, almost, I'm being forced to become a public health practitioner now since I'm in a school of public health. 
We're doing a randomized control trial in the state of Washington. So when they try out new drugs, pharmaceuticals, they do a randomized control trial where somebody gets a placebo and somebody gets the active drug and you follow them. Well, in this study, our drug are truck seats. So what we're doing is we're gonna recruit 60 truck, oops, 60 truck drivers and we're gonna measure their whole body vibration exposure in their existing tractor trailers. We're uh, subjectively trying to get them to answer questionnaires. Truckers do not answer questionnaires. Um, we're trying to get them to answer questionnaires on back pain and work function. And then uh, 20 of the drivers are gonna get nothing at all. We're gonna continue measuring with their existing air ride seat. Uh, 20 are going to get a new air suspension seat and 20 are gonna get the active suspension seat and we're gonna measure their whole body vibration exposure after the in intervention, three, six months and a year. Uh, we're gonna measure their back pain and work function for the following three months and at six months and a year. And we wanna see if there's any difference between the treatments, the people that get nothing, the people that get the air ride seat and the people that get the active suspension seat. So that's what we're up to. This will kind of be an exciting study and it's our first attempt at doing something like this and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see if providing people with new seats has any effect on low back pain and work function. And this might, uh, this is maybe a short period of time. I don't know if it's too short or if we have to measure them longer, but at least we'll get our first one year snapshot. So I think that is it for me. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ralph and then you can ask us both questions at the end. So thank you. I'm gonna hold on to the podium. So um, what I'm gonna to do today is basically, first of all, I wanna ask you forgiveness on a couple issues. One, I have a terrible Boston accent, as Scott alluded to. And secondly, I'm a Boston Bruins fan, so I apologize, <laughs> knew that. Although I, I, do ha I do share some kindred feelings for the Canucks. Corey Schneider went to my, uh, went to my college, so I do, I do root for the Canucks and I did root for them the other night. So anyway, what I'd like to do briefly this afternoon is just describe to you in practical terms what we're hear hearing from our fleets and the drivers that are in our product and give you some testimony as to what the drivers are feeling, what we're hearing back from them, how the system is performing in practical terms. Peter did a wonderful job in setting the science behind whole body vibration and what the product is trying to prevent from happening to the driver. I think what's most interesting to a fleet operator is, okay, I get that, so how are the drivers reacting to it? What are the fleets saying? And more importantly, why are some of our fleets making the investment in the product? So this is some of the, um, some of the rationale around why some of our fleets have uh, decided to make the investment with the Bose Ride system. Uh, some of them are facing a driver shortage. Uh, as we all know, and as everybody has spoken to today, the aging driver population. High insurance costs, workers' comp costs, health insurance costs. I've heard some statistics where, you know, next to fuel, it's the second largest cost that a fleet faces. Uh, the ravages of driver fatigue. We had some talk today very eloquently about what, it, what fatigue does to a driver in terms of, and to anybody, in terms of how accurately they can perform their job. And what does this all boil up to when you have a tired driver and an aging driver? Sometimes the productivity is reduced. So this is some of the key issues that some of the fleets we're doing business with are trying to address. So again, as I had said, you know, the major, major reasons can be boiled down to fatigue and what fatigue does to, to the fleet. There's a safety concern, there's accidents. That's why I'm holding on to the podium, Scott. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of fatigue, they're looking to address these areas, safety, accidents, service, their reputation. Nobody likes to see their truck on the 11 o'clock news in a ditch with their logo on the side of it. Uh, in terms of health, I mean, the cost of health is directly correlated to the cost of insurance. So workers' comp, health insurance. Again, the productivity side of, of health is, is sick days. Um, comfort and lifestyle, we touched on that again this morning. Um, how do the drivers feel when they're on their off time? How's their quality of life? How is that, uh, how does that make them feel about their job? Really, I mean, do they like being a truck driver? Do they want to continue to be a truck driver? Um, how does that help with the reputation of the industry? How does it help with the reputation of the fleet? If a driver tells another driver that they're working for a good fleet, they feel great about their job, kind of helps the business case. 
So, gives you an indication of where we're deployed throughout North America and where some of the, and what the, some of the issues the fleets are trying to address. And again, I touched on it. We have some, some deployments going on that are addressing driver extension and uh, wellness. Uh, we have some fleets that are deployed throughout North America that are looking for improving their recruiting and retention. Uh, some fleets uh, are looking to use our product as a reward mechanism, the million, two million, three million, ten million mile driver. Some fleets are looking to improve productivity, stop time, days out of work, sick days. So they're, they're focused basically on trying to drive to an ROI for their investment is looking at productivity. And work is compensation. How, if a, if a uh, fleet is uh, high on their uh, workers' comp, particularly in the States, they're paying a uh, penalty in, on their premiums, and they're trying to find ways to reduce that, again, to drive, uh, to drive profit to their bottom line. So, on to what the driver is telling us. If we look at 100% of our respondents, they break into some, you know, two populations. 90% are reporting positive benefits from our product. And of that 90% health benefits, 80% of that, that population is, is seeing improved health benefits. They're, uh, some of them are telling us, and the testimony tells us that, I used to eat a bottle of Advil a week. I'm down to a couple of pills a day, or a couple of pills a week. I feel better when I get out of the truck. I feel better when my shift's over. I'm stopping less. The fatigue benefits. This primarily circles around how a driver feels on his reset time. And some of the drivers that I've spoken to have said that their reset times and when they're home after their shifts, they can do more. They're not going on the couch like that picture we saw earlier with the Budweiser can on the stomach. They're actually playing with their children. They're doing yard work. Their home life is better. So who doesn't like the product? Because not everything in life is 100%. Well, that sort of circles around some of the issues with the product itself. We've had some concern with seat top comfort. The seat is different than the normal, than a normal air ride seat in the fact that it's foam. Some of these guys are coming out of foam on spring, so the feel is different. A lot of these guys have been driving trucks with air ride seats for 25 years. So I call it the Archie Bunker effect. I'm dating myself, but they're in that same type of seat for so long, when you take it away from them, they can't handle the change. Height. Our system needs a certain amount of travel to perform. There's a subset of drivers, and I think everybody in the room has somebody like that, that likes to dump all the air out of the seat and ride on the ground. And that kind of breaks into two categories. One is they think they're cool, and the other one is they think that by dumping the air out, they're not going to get thrown around, particularly on a rough road. They don't like our product because they're sitting too high. We can't address that. In motion, in a normal air ride seat, the driver is moving with the cab. The system is, is uh, reactive, it's not proactive. In our seat, the, seat, the driver is being held steady, but the cab is moving. So we get some issues with, I feel like I'm moving all the time. And I'll speak to this again, we talk about team drivers, but that's kind of the phenomenon they have. And if they're in the cab, I guess in Canada for 13 hours, they start to convince themselves that they're moving, they're bouncing off the roof of the cab. Sometimes we can counterman that through, you know, just taking them through it and talking to them, talking to them. Sometimes we can't. So what are the vocations we're engaged with right now? Petroleum carriers, and here's just a little snapshot. Hazmat, we're doing business with some dry van. We've had success, particularly here in Canada, with some off-road applications, primarily fuel servicing of mines where the mining road will be between seven and 10 miles. Uh, reefer fleets throughout North America. Heavy, t heavy and specialty hall. And again, just to reiterate the value proposition, here's the list I showed you earlier. What I'd like to do now is kind of give you some concrete examples of some of these major categories and some of the success stories we've had with the fleets that have tried to address some of these issues and concerns within their operations. Work as compensation. It's been publicized, I think, in truck news, but we did, we're doing business with a fleet in uh, the greater Toronto area, excuse me, Herb, I think most of you have heard of it. And they had, a, um, they had quite a difficult situation with a driver that was about to go out on work as comp. And they wanted to get him back in the, uh, in the rig. So here's a comment from this Director of Safety and Compliance, Tom Baylor, that over, oops, gotta go back. 
that over a three-year period of time, if they had annualized the loss to the operation in terms of workers' comp, that claim would have cost them around $369,000. The driver went back to work successfully from, one, from no days to two days to a full shift. So you can see his comment here. When he looked at the cost of the seat versus the cost of the impact uh, in, um, in the lost time injury claim, you can see the ROI. Team drivers. In the States, and I'm, I'm going to assume in Canada, there's a growing trend towards team drivers. Getting that, especially on long hauls, getting that truck operating as many times as you can, as long as you can for productivity and efficiency reasons. I spoke to the motion issue earlier. We have an adoption curve. It goes anywhere from one day to two days to a week. And then that 10% I talked about sometimes never. The interesting phenomenon with team drivers is when there's two people sitting, one but somebody's in a conventional air ride seat on the passenger side and somebody else is in the Bose ride system, that motion issue goes away very quickly because, as Peter said, the driver in the, in the shotgun seat is bouncing and the other person is as steady as, as can be. Right away, they're convinced they're not moving. The adoption curve is, uh, is a lot shorter. Another interesting sidelight, and there's no science behind this. This is pure testimony of a few... Um, team drivers that I've spoken to, the off driver when he's in the bunk appears to be sleeping better. He's telling us that it takes him, he's faster to go to sleep, he's more restful in the bunk. When his shift comes on, he's ready to go. As opposed to that slow ramp up to work, trying to get the aches and pains out of him, it's gone. Our team drivers by and large are the happiest subpopulation of who we have in the state. Career extension and rough roads. Particularly in Canada, we do business with some fleets that have very lucrative dedicated routes. And these are usually over rough roads, whether it's up north into a mining operation. The drivers that are on those routes are highly valued. They're known by the customer. They're a known commodity to the fleet. They're the top performer. That's that so-called highly valued back, back side of the curve in terms of the age. We've had great success in extending those drivers' careers. Feedback we've got from both the fleet and the driver is, hey, I was thinking of hanging it up after a year or so, year or so from now. I think I'm going to go for a few more years. So again, it's the soft cost, but you can see the ROI on a highly valuable driver. So that's it. I wanted to be brief and just give you some highlights as to our experiences thus far over the two or three years that we've been commercialized with this throughout North America. And I just want to thank the organization and everybody for uh, your attention, and particularly for the really good salmon. That was delicious, so thank you. Thank you.